Hello. Let's start with our second session at stage three. And we have here um, Parker Higgins from San Francisco. And he is, um, he is one of the, is an activist and blogger of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And um, he's here today to, um, to present us a session about um, black to gray to black, lessons, lessons from two decades of online activism. And he will tell us a little bit more. Um, and he's asking whether we should have a museum of online activism or not. And um, I'm very interested in his answers. Okay, let's start. Hi, everybody. This is a little strange. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming to see me instead of Bianca Jagger. Uh, I'll put one ear off and I'll let you know if she says anything very interesting. Um, so, I uh, thank you for coming. My name is Parker Higgins. Uh, I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I uh, hope that many of you know my employer, the EFF, but uh, in case you don't, um, we are a, uh, we're a nonprofit based in San Francisco that's been working at the intersection of, uh, of civil liberties and technology for over 20 years. So we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, and as part of that, we've been involved in a lot of activism campaigns. Um, most recently, things like SOPA and ACTA and TPP, and we've been working on activism and uh, legislative and, uh, and really court pushes uh, against NSA spying. So it's, a, it's a, um, a broad range of things, and I'm very proud of my employer, so I'll, I'll keep talking about them over and over. Um, but personally, I have been a copyright reform activist for long before I started there. Um, and I, I want to give a little context. I'm going to be talking about, I say two decades, it's actually 18 years of, of activism history. Uh, I'm 26, so, so the first things I talk about, I studied. Like, I, I, I sat down and I researched them. And then some of the later things I talked about, I talk about um, were things that were very formative to me. And then, uh, and then the, the most recent things, things like SOAP are things that I've been honored and privileged to, to work on myself. So there are three um, major points that I want to talk about today. Uh, the first one is history. Um, I, as I say in the, in the description, we don't keep very good records of the history of online activism. Um, we remember some of it, but it starts to fade. I'll be talking about um, particularly online activism that's about online speech. So speech about speech centered on the SOPA blackouts of 2012, uh, Gray Tuesday, which was a 2004 um, campaign, and the Black World Wide Web protests uh, against the, the Communications Decency Act, um, which, which took place in 1996. Um, I expect everybody here probably knows uh, a fair bit about the, the SOPA blackouts, um, but probably fewer people are familiar with Gray Tuesday and even fewer know about the CDA blackouts, and that's fine. Um, I think that's because uh, of the second point, which is context, um, that we tend to overestimate the lasting place in public consciousness that each of the campaigns that we uh, work on or take part in uh, will hold. And then at the same time, we underestimate the importance of earlier campaigns. So people who were, were affected by SOAP or who took part in the act of protests uh, think that that will last a long time. Um, and in a sense, it will. I, I do think that it will have a major impact, but I think the details start to fade pretty quickly. Um, and then at the same time, by not looking at earlier campaigns, uh, we tend to focus on the wrong things. So when we talk about uh, what worked with SOPA, when we talk about SOPA activism, we look at the tactics. We say, oh, it was a blackout, and it was major companies that took part. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's a, a mistake, um, particularly because uh, we should look to patterns for strategy. So we should look to patterns and strategy, not just tactics. Uh, the most effective campaigns over the decades, and I'm picking three, but there are many I could pick from, uh, have been the ones that have harnessed essential qualities of the network. And those essential qualities shift over time, meaning that the tactics will have to change, but the impulses underlying them remain the same. And I think that we duplicate a lot of labor if we don't, if we don't learn this. Um, and then as sort of a bonus item, uh, I want to talk about uh, a few sort of evergreen tips and, and, and the way that path dependence has affected online activism, which I'll unpack later. Um, so starting with the history, uh, I, I want to be, I, I want to just give a shout out real quick. Um, I said earlier that we don't keep very good records of online activism campaign, and I think that's true. 
Uh, but I couldn't even begun to do this research without the Internet Archive at archive.org. Um, things like news articles, uh, campaign pages on domains that didn't get renewed, um, and even uh, intentional historical revisionism, where someone who's lost uh, from an activism campaign goes back and changes things. Um, that all gets captured by the archive. So I, I think that when we talk about uh, learning that history, this is a, a very important resource. In the case of SOPA in particular, there's a division of, of archive. It's, it's part volunteer and part run by Jason Scott there. Um, called the Archive Team, and they grabbed a huge collection of web pages um, that were that were blacked out on the on the protest day, and so uh, that's a that's going to be a major major resource for future researchers. So I, I want to thank them. Um, but uh, there are many. <coughs> uh, hold on, that's a, that slide's supposed to be a joke. Uh, so there are many key examples of activism and online speech, and I've picked these three because they encapsulate well the rise of different major themes uh, and formats of activism. So the parallels between the SOPA blackouts and the CDA blackouts that I hope to draw uh, are they're striking, um, even though these two campaigns were separated by 20 years. Um, but what, what's really striking to me is the differences between the two. What changes over 20 years? Um, and then at the same time, I want to talk about how these might take place now. So I don't think the, the Great Tuesday campaign would be possible today, which is frustrating and I think something that we ought to examine. So beginning with SOPA, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I think everyone knows about it, but I do want to make a few points. Um, first, it's, it's easy to forget kind of the sense of inevitability that a lot of people felt about SOPA, that this was something that was going to happen. And that's because uh, beginning in 1982, uh, the U.S. passed 15 separate anti-piracy laws. Um, that's one every two years for, for three decades. Um, and, and that's the media lobby is a powerful lobby, and it was pushing for these laws. And the public interest had basically been ignored. And so uh, that, was, uh, that was kind of the background against which we approached this. Um, and the blackout tactic uh, that, we ended up, that ended up being so popular on so many sites it was um, proposed by a lot of different people, um, but Wikipedia was the first kind of major player to, uh, to, to propose that it would black out its own site. And really it was Jimmy Whale saying that like on his, on his personal page. Um, and he mentioned it specifically as a reference, people, people forget this, as a reference to uh, something that the Italian Wikipedia had done uh, just the, the previous year. So um, this, is not, this wasn't a new tactic. Um, and I bring this up as a way to say that uh, there are ways in which uh, SOPA, the SOPA protests were, they get described all the time as unprecedented. And I do think that there are ways in which they're unprecedented. But in other ways, uh, they're very well historically established. <clears throat> For this movement, beating such a powerful lobby and in such a dramatic way did a lot to galvanize the online activism community. Um, and part of the thinking that sparked my research on this talk over the past two years, basically since the blackout, I've been thinking about this sort of thing, um, has been the continuing drumbeat for other issues to have, as it's described, their own SOPA moment. Um, and it's obvious to me that uh, we can't replicate the perfect storm that led to the SOPA protests. Um, but if we understand from a historical perspective what did lead to that, I think that we can come closer to, to capturing those forces. So. Um, uh, just to, as, as a little bit of aftermath, in the wake of, of the SOPA protests, um, members of the activism community who'd worked on this um, got together and led an effort uh, called the Internet Defense League, and the idea was to create a cat signal that, uh, that sites could uh, embed on their website um, all the time, and then in case there was an emergency, the kind of thing that Internet activists would want to get involved on, uh, the, the groups behind the Internet Defense League could, could jump into action and, and remotely update the little widget. Um, and that never really worked as planned, but I, I think it's important to, to kind of consider it in the totality of the event. So then we have another event called Great Tuesday, um, which was eight years before the Internet Blackout Day, um, where a lot of the web took part uh, in an action that was centered around uh, a mashup album. So the, the Grey album, which many of you might have heard of, is uh, it was by DJ Danger Mouse and it mashed up um, the Black Album by Jay-Z and the White Album by the Beatles. And uh, I, a really important thing I think is that it was considered very good. It was a really good artistic album that got Album of the Year awards and stuff. Um, 
and uh, he made it basically for friends. There's no way to do this legally. And so he made it and circulated it, and it ended up online. Um, and people who were hosting it started to get takedown letters um, from EMI, which owns the publishing in the White Album. Um, so uh, that really frustrated a lot of the people who work on, uh, on free speech issues and, and online, especially music issues. And so uh, a group called Downhill Battle decided to coordinate an action against it, and they called it Great Tuesday. Um, and on one day, February 24th, 2004, they convinced hundreds of sites to make the album available for download um, or change their layout gray. And it was, it was hugely successful. Um, the album on that day alone racked up enough downloads that if you, if you calculated it the same way, uh, it would have placed high in, in the billboard charts for the week. Um, but more importantly, the album and the protest got lots of international press coverage. And so this was really a, a major success. And for me as a, as a budding copyright activist, it was, it was really formative. Um, and so I, I want to talk uh, later in the third section about why I think it was so successful, because I think that it encapsulates a lot of the strategies that, uh, if not the tactics that we want to talk about. Um, and as an aside, uh, just because I, I work in copyright a lot, um, the album and the press around this protest uh, really launched Danger Mouse's career. Uh, I, when researching this, I found out he's won five Grammys since. So he's, he's really like in the top stratosphere of music producers, and it started with something that, that wouldn't be considered legal. Um, and then, so going back a, uh, even further to 1996, um, there was a set of protests called the Black World Wide Web protests, and they were kind of the first internet blackouts. Um, it was around the newly passed American law called the Communications Decency Act. Um, and, uh, and while it's hard to get, it, it was hard at the time to get exact numbers of how many, how many sites were participating. Um, it's even more difficult today, but the estimates are that it was something like 5 to 10% of all sites on the web at the time um, taking part uh, by going black or going offline either um, for part or all of 48 hours around the time that President Clinton was set to sign the bill. Um, he did sign the bill, uh, and it was challenged in a lawsuit. Most of it was later declared unconstitutional um, and overturned. So uh, it's, it's kind of a delayed victory. I don't think that was a major activism victory. Um, but this generated a lot of attention. Um, and as a, so, so we've got the blackout, and I think that it looks a lot of, very similar to the SOPA blackout. And as a historical note, um, it was in conjunction with this blackout that EFF in, in 1996 launched the uh, Free Speech Online Blue Ribbon Campaign, uh, which we asked people to embed in the um, <clears throat> asked people to embed in their sites, uh, and it was unusual at the time. We said hot link this image, really load it from EFF.org, um, and the idea was that in case there was really another emergency. Uh, EFF could, could remotely update it um, so that they could spread the news. So really, I think a lot of people didn't realize it at the time, but it's, it's an, almost an exact parallel to the Internet Defense League. Um, and this was very popular. Uh, it was throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, it was really widely embedded, and it made EFF.org one of the top 10 most linked to sites on the entire web, um, basically on the strength of this. So I want to talk about context. Uh, these are the campaigns I've chosen to highlight from 20 years of activism, um, and there are, there are many others I could have chosen uh, from, the, from the list. Um, there are dozens or, or hundreds of really remarkable pieces of activism throughout those decades. Um, one thing about these three in particular is that they're US heavy. I, 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 that's what I'm most familiar with, but there have been a lot of uh, great campaigns around the world. Um, but I think what's important is not just knowing the facts here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not just a chance to, to think about the Grey Album if you haven't thought about it in 10 years. Um, I want to give these things some context because I think that without that, uh, we forget the older efforts and we focus too much on the wrong parts of the newer efforts. Um, the activism community has spoken a lot uh, about legislators all over the world who are nervous about uh, their proposals, and this was a phrase that, that got used in Washington, getting SOPA'd, that you know, a lot of attention all at once would, would change it. And I think that's valid, but uh, it's not something that we can count on legislators thinking about for very long. Um, and I personally, a little anecdote here is that for two years after the SOPA protest, that was how I would, I would introduce myself. You know, I'm an activist, what do you do? Well, do you remember that day that Wikipedia was like hard to access and Google had the blackout on its logo? 
So that's the sort of thing I do. And anecdotally, I'll tell you that it may not seem like it in this room, but people have forgotten about that. Um, people don't really remember uh, what exactly SOPA was or what exactly the web did. And so um, I, think, I think that's something that we have to count on, and we can't, we can't really rest on our laurels for very long. Um, especially because if we do that, we've gotten ourselves into kind of the worst of all worlds um, because we get... Uh, we, we start to lose the veneer of, of the general victory of free speech, um, but, but then uh, we're critical of ourselves and the, and the media and the press that do remember this are critical of our efforts um, because they're holding up uh, kind of an unrealistic standard of what we should be aspiring to, not actually uh, successes in these campaigns. When you have the proper context, I think the picture, the picture is not as bleak, um, but we have to remember that the SOPA protests uh, didn't show the content industry once and for all uh, what we're capable of. Uh, they were a high point of a, of a very particular kind of protest, um, but if we're looking for the next SOPA blackouts, we should be looking forward to what kind of action uh, will work best on the internet and the web of 2014, not what worked best in 2012. And so uh, that brings me to, to strategies. Um, what I really think that we can get out of a historical look that includes context is an idea for what things work as strategies um, and, uh, and not just what works as tactics. So it's not, it shouldn't be like, oh, blackouts, those are really effective. It should be what drove that. Um, and uh, I, think that, I think that really the, the framework that works best for this is thinking about uh, the way that activism responds to the architecture of the system that it's in. Um, and so that's kind of a rephrasing of, of Lawrence Lessig's famous quote that code is law. Uh, and what he was saying is the sorts of speech that we're capable of is shaped by decisions that are made by engineers and architects of the platforms. That the code that they set out, it really, it functions as law. Um, but in the same way that that's true, we can also craft our speech to take advantage of the same properties in those systems. Um, so we can, and we can, at the same time, we can take advantage of things that we know about the people who will be taking part. So here's a simple example. Um, I think this is simpler than some of the examples I'm talking about. Uh, that it's a decision that most social networks have uh, as part of the way that they're laid out, an avatar next to every post that you put on those networks. And it's another decision that users can change those avatars as frequently as they want to. Um, and that's not an immutable fact about the way things are. It's, it's a design decision. It's a pattern that we see over and over. Um, and uh, and from a, from a like, cognitive perspective, um, people who identify with a group and see a simple action they can take to indicate their in-group status will want to do that. Um, and so as a result, users can send a message by coordinating their avatars. And, uh, and we saw that with green-tinged avatars supporting uh, Iranian protesters and probably even more with the human rights campaign's massive uh, uh, same-sex marriage um, action. Um, and, and there, I, I want to encourage you to go to hrc.org slash viral where they talk about this. And the effect of this was really huge. It moved the discussion so much. And it was really, I think this is derided as one of the most um, kind of bland examples of clicktivism, uh, changing your avatars. But it really does have an effect. And so um, I, I, I don't, I know that it seems like I'm overcomplicating things um, by taking a simple style of campaign and setting it in this framework. Um, but I think it makes sense to use that as an example before moving on to more complex ones. Um, because I want to focus on maybe a quality that we consider more fundamental to the internet and to the web. Uh, and that's articulated best by John Gilmore, who's one of the founders of EFF. And he said, uh, in 1993, he said, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. Um, and this is, thank you. Uh, <laughs> when he said that, it was uh, technically true on a really literal level. Um, it was, from, from a technical perspective, uh, the network actually didn't distinguish between uh, information that was gone because someone removed it and information that was gone because a hard drive crashed somewhere. And so uh, it used replicated data and it would just, it would replace it. Um, and uh, and I, think that, I think that one of the powerful things about the CDA protests is it inverted this. They took advantage of the fact that this isn't really true on the web in the same way. Um, the, the public can engage in, in a limited uh, self-censorship campaign, and the information really disappears. Um, and, 
and because of people's, uh, you know, we have a, a quality called loss aversion where we think more about, we, we value more things we might lose than things we might gain. Um, and so that's a, that's a really powerful motivator. And so the CDA blackout showed people what they stood to lose. Um, and, it, and it inverted this, and I think that's powerful. Um, and Great Tuesday took this quality and, and kind of took it, took it from another angle. And it said, okay, so this may not be strictly true on the web from a technical level, but in the, in the network that we have today, the fact that many, many, many people have individual sites and servers they control means that individual webmasters can choose through their human behavior to replicate that quality of the older networks. And so individual um, people with a site can say, uh, as soon as the, the last copy of the Grey album disappears, they can put their own copy up and make it available. Um, and at the same time, I think the fact that this album was very good and that it wasn't available elsewhere um, made it more uh, something that was better for, um, for tapping into people's loss aversion. Uh, it's a rare concrete example of, of uh, really the kind of thing that copyright threatens. Usually you have to say, you have to speculate, well, if we didn't have this law, here's the kind of thing we might have. Um, but with the, with the Grey album, we said, here's what we actually could have. Here's a great album that you enjoy that could go away. Um, and I think that was a, that's a real success by the activism group that, that found that. Downhill Battle picked that out as a great example, and they put together a great campaign. Um, I think taking this, uh, this further up to 2012, we're in a really different situation. Um, and that's that the web has largely uh, become centralized in a lot of ways. Users spend more and more time on fewer and fewer sites, and a smaller percentage have access to server space that they really control. So if you think about how Great Tuesday might have played out today, people, for example, might have embedded a YouTube video that included a song from the Grey album on their site. But of course, that means that Google can either choose to leave it up or they can take it down. Or they can make it available in some countries, but not others, which I think maybe some people in this room are familiar with. Um, or they can run ads against it that gives revenues directly to anybody who claims to be the rights holder, whether or not the end use uh, might be considered a fair use or a fair dealing in some countries. And in the Grey album, we may say, like, okay, that's not that big a deal if EMI gets some money off this. Um, but uh, if the campaign is, a, a, say, an environmental group that's re repurposing uh, ads from an oil company or a political group that's pointing, out, that's pointing out flaws in campaign ads, the idea that we depend on Google to stand up to those rights holders is kind of alarming. So at the same time, uh, the recentralization has properties uh, that we can exploit. So the lobbies that push for laws like SOPA sometimes like to frame, uh, frame that effort as, uh, as a top-down campaign. Uh, where a handful of massive internet companies just, just push their, their will. And that's not true. It was a cooperation between a lot of people and, and uh, mostly engineers at those companies, and we eventually got those on board. But what really did help is that those companies have, a, have an enormous reach. They could, make, they could reach millions of people on a single day. And that's a property of the new network. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why I think we should be pushing for a more kind of re-decentralized web. Um, it's a better place for speech and it makes sense, it makes more sense technically and it upholds the internet values that, that we really, um, we really uh, cherish. But at the same time, I think we miss major opportunities if we don't look at the qualities of the web that we have and try to use those qualities to our advantage. So I hope this quick sketch over, over three kind of disparate campaigns uh, gives you a sense for why some online campaigns work so much better than others. Uh, the ones that work use facts about the network to make points about the network, and that's a powerful thing. Um, but while things are uh, uh, changing, it's also important to note that the technologies and techniques that make these campaigns possible are really old tools. Uh, we're just getting better at using them. So for example, uh, at working on the SOPA campaign, a major turning point was when all of the groups that were that had been talking about this uh, set up and you know wait for it uh, a mailing list. We actually we started a mailing list and and using this this decades old technology uh, that was kind of what enabled us to take this to the next level. And, and there were there were a bunch of mails each day. And this is this is really a thing that that kind of changed the game. And it's old technology. And there were other things that that were new and made it easier. Um, you know, cheap conference calls and VoIP. Uh, 
and we could also use things like GitHub and Google Docs. But so much we did, we did with tools that we knew well. Um, and so I think that really one of the reasons why we have to learn our history is because uh, it, it reminds us that we don't have to wait for better tools. We can learn to use our tools better. And what I mean is that um, the development that makes new campaigns possible is not technology, it's learning from experience and is reducing the transaction costs of working together. So that's why I think learning our history is so important, uh, that we can make much more powerful campaigns when we stand on the shoulders of the activism that came before us. And this is, of course, a famous quote. The great thing about this is that Isaac Newton said it, but so had many other people before him. So it's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so I want to thank you for your time, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. It looks like I ran almost until the end, but maybe there's one or two questions. So thank you. Are there any questions? And, but you will also be um, be here, and um, you might uh, post some questions after afterwards exactly. and, and outside of the stage. Thing. Thank you. Okay.